it looks like uh, we've got just about everybody here and it's time to start. Um, let me welcome you back to the uh, closing plenary session of the spring uh, 2016 um, member meeting. I hope that you have had a successful uh, day and a half here. Uh, you found some interesting sessions, uh, learned a few things. I have to say, uh, I've um, seen a couple of sessions that really have given me a lot to think about and left me uh, feeling um, really kind of reinvigorated about a couple of things. Uh, so I, I hope you share some of that feeling. And uh, I also hope you got a chance to at least briefly enjoy some of the uh, um, some of the nice weather here and uh, maybe take a minute to watch the water go by. I just have a couple of um, things I want to um, deal with administratively before we get to the, uh, get to the matters at hand. Uh, first off, I want to draw your attention to a piece of paper that was in your folder when you registered that has a heading of future meetings. Um, we will be meeting in the fall at the Capitol Hilton in Washington, DC, December 12th and 13th, and I hope to see many of you there. Next spring on April 3rd and 4th, we will be in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which will be a uh, new venue for CNI, and uh, I uh, hope that you'll be able to join us there. We are doing another um, JISC CNI uh, joint meeting. You've got data on that. Um, that will be uh, that will start with a reception on the night of the fifth, and we'll run through the sixth um, of July. It will be held in Oxford. Um, we've pretty much got the schedule together on that now, and. Uh, Joan or I will be putting a pointer out, um, I would say probably later this week, um, uh, that will take you to a website with information on that if you're interested. I also want to note one other um, meeting that we are joint sponsoring. Uh, this came out too late to get on the page um, of future meetings, but we do have some handouts uh, out at the registration desk. That's the fifth um, incarnation of the Designing Libraries for the 21st Century uh, meeting. It'll be held September 18th through 20 of this year at the University of Calgary. It's co-sponsored by CNI, the University of Calgary, and the North Carolina State University Libraries. And I know a number of folks here have been to um, earlier meetings in the series, and I'm delighted that uh, we'll be going forward with another one this year. The other thing I want to do is just say a few thank yous. Um, the heart of this meeting in many ways is the breakout sessions, and um, I'd like to call, call for a, uh, a really good round of applause for all of the people who contributed wonderful breakout sessions to this meeting. Thank you. Um, we will be getting the follow-on material from those breakout sessions up on the website over the next few weeks, um, as well as uh, videos, so stay tuned for that. Um, I'd like to say a thank you, not just to the CNI staff, um, but also to some folks who um, came from the University of Texas at San Antonio to help us out with some of the, um, some of the um, session setup and uh, AV. Uh, a big round of applause to them and to all of the folks at CNI who put this meeting together and made it run really smoothly. Thank you. And with that, let me get to the main event. So this is going to be a plenary um, with uh, three speakers here. 
I actually am going to take a couple of minutes at the front um, to put some of this in context because this is a plenary that sits very close to one of the core concerns um, that uh, we are spending time on at CNI. And so I wanna just make that connection and underscore it really strongly. This is gonna be recorded and we will make the video available, but we are not going to capture the uh, discussion and Q&A at the end um, for posterity. So if you want to uh, enjoy that, if you want to benefit from that and share in that, it's a really good thing you're here because it's gonna be your one and only opportunity to do so. Uh, hopefully that is gonna give us an opportunity to talk frankly about some issues that um, get a little interesting sometimes. So, let me, let me frame this a bit. One of the key jobs of the research library community, of course, is and always has been to preserve the scholarly record. But a second responsibility of the research library system collectively in um, partnership with archives, museums, and many other memory organizations is to ensure that we preserve and organize and collect the evidence which is gonna be critical for current scholarship and for scholarship going into the future. A lot of that evidence exists out in the world. It's the actions of individuals and corporations and government bodies. It's the work of not just scholars, but of artists and political figures and legal figures and uh, uh, other folks. We'll never collect all of this, of course, but it's essential that we collect a really good, diverse base of it in order to make sure that it's there for people who want to understand and extract insights into the world as it exists and as, as it had existed. The parameters around this collection are very different in a world where more and more of our creations and more and more of the documentation of our activities is in digital form. Um, it's easy to think about this as a digital preservation problem and that is deeply misleading in a certain sense. Um, it really is a problem about collecting and managing and about stewardship broadly. Um, if you can't collect it, you can't preserve it. If, you, if your collections are under attack and their integrity is undermined, um, it becomes very difficult to talk about um, being sure that the evidence is there to support future scholarship. Parts of the cultural record have I think always been controversial. Um, they've always been contested. Uh, there seem to be parties who feel that there are certain memories that shouldn't be there anymore, certain actions that shouldn't be documented and shouldn't be public. And as society, we struggle with these kinds of things all the time. Often there are, you know, legitimate um, trade-offs in there. There are privacy considerations. There are commercial um, considerations. There are national security considerations. I often find myself wondering actually whether the presence of controversy and um, contesting around parts of the record may not be a signal that these are particularly interesting materials, particularly 
potentially fruitful evidence for scholars because clearly there are differences of opinion about how to assess them and how to interpret them, um, at, least, um, at least in the present time. We are very familiar with you know, situations where one nation's state secrets are evidence um, of human rights violations um, uh, in other countries or are viewed that way. It feels to me like in the digital world, the various avenues and instruments through which people can attempt to suppress or disrupt or contest um, parts of the evidentiary record, the cultural record, um, are if anything more numerous. The countermeasures perhaps are also more numerous. Um, I think though that we are moving into what is a different world um, and that our stewardship uh, uh, organizations face really deep challenges um, in terms of rethinking how they proceed on their mission. Sometimes you have to be pretty courageous as a stewardship institution and take a stand on some of these things. Um, decide that you are going to step up to stewardship of some particular body of evidence. And we're gonna talk about some case studies of all of these kinds of situations today. Uh, I am going to go over there and lurk quietly. Um, I'm very flattered that our presenters today have asked me to join them in the Q&A um, in the uh, flattering hopes that I can help with that conversation perhaps a little bit. Um, but I hope that that gives you a frame for why I am so pleased to bring this plenary to CNI and uh, why I think it's so important in the context of CNI's mission and programmatic objectives. I'd like to make three introductions here, although I think um, these folks are going to be familiar to many of you at least. Going in this direction, um, Todd Grappone, Elizabeth McCauley, and Heather Brinston, who is stepping in um, very late for Sharon Farb, who uh, very unfortunately was unable to be here, but um, uh, I think that Heather is going to do a uh, superb job that would make um, Sharon proud in helping to advance this conversation. I'm not gonna waste time with their biographies. Um, uh, you can find all of that on our website. Uh, I am simply going to, at this point, welcome these folks, say thanks again, and turn it over to Todd. Thanks, Cliff. Uh, I'm gonna show a, uh, just a, a short movie here to get us started.
I'm kind of curious, how does that video, does that video, how does it make you feel? Do you um, see a little bit of yourself in that? Um, you know, some of the uh, collections you do. It's, there's video, there's documentation in there that, that people don't want you to see. Um, you know, a lot of it, I think, looks, um, looks pretty innocuous, um, but to some organizations, it's, it's, um, uh, it's secret, and they, they don't want you to, to have it and to share it. Um, uh, some of those videos we saw are pretty scary, uh, and there's governments that don't want you to see it and don't want us to share it. Um, and today, that's what we're gonna talk a little bit about. Um, so, just as an overview uh, to our presentation, and these are some of the themes we're going to hit on today. Um, you know, the mission of uh, the university library, the academic library. Um, just we've we've always collected history. Uh, some of the collecting we are doing um, looks a little different now, and some of the tools we use are different, but it's still history. Um, we're trying uh, to use these tools to preserve the broad historical record. And we're very uh, concerned about privacy. When it comes to the people we work with, um, these are people who have sacrificed a lot of, uh, personally. Their families are in danger often. Uh, we need to be very concerned about uh, the people we, uh, we partner with. Um, and it's about trust. I mean, those people who partner with us, who have this content, who are um, of interest, so to speak, uh, to certain places, um, they need to trust us that we will follow through with what we say. Um, so, uh, who here, uh, who, who here, who's, which of your organizations, uh, can I see a show of hands, uses cloud infrastructure services? Okay, so uh, a lot of us do, mine certainly does. Uh, you know, those cloud infrastructure services, uh, they make a lot of sense to us economically. Um, uh, they allow us to really focus more on the research mission as opposed to the IT mission of the university. So when we move things to thing, move our services and our platforms uh, to something like Amazon Web Services, it makes a lot of sense for us as an organization. Um, but that movement to the cloud, uh, as it's happened over the past decade, um, it's not just an academic library thing. It's it's an industry-wide thing. It's a it's a it's it's a um, an effort that um, has impacted just about every news organization um, and every communication vehicle. Um, and what that's led to is a decentralization, uh, I'm sorry, a centralization of the web. So when I first got into IT, the first thing I would do uh, when I began a new job would be to go in, unpack a, a nice Sun server, set up a, uh, uh, an Apache or some other web server, and then uh, we'd get content up online. These days, I, I buy a hosted service at Amazon, um, and it comes pre-built with a lot of the tools and services I need. That's all very convenient. It allows me to, to uh, do my work in a different way. Um, that, de that centralization of services, however, has had a big impact on dissenting voices. Um, people who have something to say about um, an organization, their government, uh, they don't want to do it in a, in, on the web these days, which has become um, uh, controlled by a smaller group of technology companies, device manufacturers, and underneath the regime of, uh, of a few governments. It's, it's really had a, a, a chilling effect on free speech. And, Um, last week, uh, uh, Jason Griffey from Harvard wrote this interesting uh, piece on Boing Boing talking about uh, the future of the web. Um, and uh, Jason was talking about uh, um, why the libraries should be supporting free and open access and anonymous access to the internet. Um, he was talking about it in terms of public libraries. I think we in academic libraries um, we enjoy a little more anonymity. Uh, recent news from the UC system, you know, uh, aside, 
a, a little more anonymity, I think, than a lot of our uh, public library colleagues um, have. Um, but Jason in his article was talking about um, freedom of speech and anonymity and why those things were important and how libraries can help support that. So uh, he talked about the Library Freedom Project and the Kilton Public Libraries Project to install an anonymous relay in their library. And you know, I, I, I read this and I thought, oh, you know, I, I wish he could have posted this two weeks from now, because uh, it's a lot of the same things that I wanted to talk about today. It's true. You know, we need to um, we need to be able to support free speech. Uh, we need to be able to support open access uh, in a way that our patrons feel like they can uh, enjoy the anonymity of. Um, uh, that they need in order to have dissenting discussions. Jason was really talking about it uh, in terms of um, supporting uh, patron access. And while we don't, uh, we don't use, we provide these tools for our patrons at, at UCLA, um, we do use some of these tools to collect the connection, to collect the collections we're about to, to talk about. So I wanted to um, start off by, we're going to do a couple of case studies here, and you're going to hear about some of the projects we do. Um, and again, we're going to harken back to some of the themes we, we talked about originally. The first project I want to talk to you about um, is this project called the International Digital Ephemera Project. Um, we've been doing it for about four years. Uh, we, what the goal of the, of the project is, is to partner with uh, international libraries to uh, digitize parts of their collection that they might not uh, think about digitizing. And it's been a lot of fun. Uh, we've got uh, national partners with the National Library of Cuba, the National Library of Armenia, and the National Library of Israel, and a number of other smaller uh, uh, regional partners. And we feel like it's going great. Um, and so, but that's not really the story. The story is, um, uh, at the beginning of the project, um, I gave a report I gave a reporter from the Daily Bruin an interview about the project, and you know I had mentioned um, some of the collections that we found um, in um, uh, with our first partner in Israel, and some of those collections were um, uh, were very political and, and counter to the Israeli government. And um, you know I just made a quip about um, you know we're archivists, not activists, and you know but we really enjoy this kind of work. Um, what happened is um, we had a, a couple of um, uh, projects that were going on uh, at UCLA. We had students who um, were in Tahrir Square, Tahrir Square during the Egyptian uprising. Uh, and they were there, um, uh, I'm just gonna, this is one of the things they collected, by the way, in, in Tahrir Square. They were, they were there uh, just on a, uh, uh, to really to, to, to study. And they happened to be there and they happened to collect uh, a, a chunk of uh, ephemeral content that uh, um, uh, that was distributed during the uprising, but they also collected uh, a number of tweets. Uh, they collected about 400,000 tweets from about 50,000 users, um, and they collected all of these tweets within uh, 200 miles of Cairo. Uh, and as we started working with these collections, um, we started noticing. Um, something about uh, Twitter collecting um, and about, you know, one of the things that um, centralization of the internet has meant is that the information we post there is inherently ephemeral. Uh, that information uh, relies on it being current, it being popular. Um, and when we started working with this collection uh, a few years after the Egyptian revolution, we noticed that uh, a large and, and disturbing number of uh, references within the tweets uh, were gone, and 60% of those were not archived. Um, this is uh, something that we need to um, remember if we're interested in, in collecting the kind of political speech that goes on these days. Uh, two weeks ago, there was a, a bombing in Belgium. Uh, we started collecting tweets uh, and other social media uh, related to that bombing. Um, and uh, when we looked at that collection, this is a two-week-old collection, um, uh, we'd noticed that um, the references when those tweets were degrading at about 20% a week. 
Um, now, a lot of that, I think, has to do with the ephemeral nature of the web. A lot of that has to do with um, the, uh, what's being connected to these documents, uh, to these tweets, the references they make. Um, but the, most, the, the important thing about doing this kind of collecting, is, you know, one of the difficulties is, is you have to really do it in real time. Uh, you can't decide um, today uh, that you're going to start collecting tweets from an event that happened four years ago or 30 years ago. It's just not going to work. It's got to be in real time. Um, the most tweeted reference link from uh, the Egyptian Revolution um, was this picture. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. Uh, it's a picture of um, uh, um, a circle of Christians praying, uh, being surrounded by Muslims. Um, and this was a picture that uh, um, went out across the globe. It got picked up in a number of places. But the reference within that tweet um, was gone a few years later. Uh, and it took some digging for us to find it. Um, but in a collection of 400,000 tweets, we're just not going to dig a lot. You know, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So we, we dug up this one um, as an exemplar. But um, it, one of the difficulties in making these collections uh, is really the, uh, the ephemeral nature of the content and how quickly you have to get it. Um, one of the other um, partners we, we started with uh, a few years ago um, was uh, a gentleman named Ali Jamshidi. Uh, uh, Los Angeles has a very large number of uh, uh, Iranian expats, and Ali uh, uh, was what I thought was, was one of those folks. Um, when the Egyptian revolution broke out in 2009, Ali was a, uh, a graduate student in computer science in Russia. Uh, and when he found out about what was going on in his home country, he started writing and blogging about it. Um, uh, his, um, his journey is a fascinating one from, um, uh, from Russia. Uh, you saw him in our opening video. Um, he, uh, he had to um, basically run around the globe in front of the Iranian government. Um, and one of his stops was in Malaysia, where the Secret Service questioned him for a number of hours about his activity. Um, and I wanted, um, one of the things I wanted to mention is this is a website that we captured uh, after he was in Los Angeles. It's a website that uh, he put up as part of the Green Movement uh, that is a positive message. It, it was intended to be a positive message about, um, about the politics, uh, the political movement, and the people. Um, this website was hacked. Uh, a few, maybe six months after they put it up, uh, the message was subtly changed. The talk about Ali uh, being a criminal, uh, his activities were criminal, um, and uh, for um, when we started the project, uh, without Ali, this would have been the only version of the website we had. Um, but we partnered with Ali. We got the, the original files. Um, and we were able to pull it together. Um, so if you think about modern political protest, um, you, know, uh, you know, it looks a lot different than um, you know, uh, what happened with our election in, I think it was 2000 with the hanging chads, you know, where we, you know, by and large as a society, let the law uh, handle it. Uh, in a lot of other countries, that's, um, they just don't have that kind of faith. Um, and what they do is they use their, their cell phones um, and they use their other electronic devices to document what's going on day to day in their lives. Um, and uh, in, in the uh, Green Movement in 2009, um, they, uh, they really wanted to share this video content. It, it was. Um, by and large, you know, one of the first Arab Spring uprisings. Um, it was the Twitter revolution. Um, and uh, after the protests of the, of the um, uh, election, uh, it was um, the people on the ground tried to, were, were starting to share content. They, they wanted to get it out. And uh, the government uh, began shutting off parts of the internet. 
Um, and uh, they started using uh, different proxy servers to, to, to move content out and to give it to safe havens and give it to people they trusted like Ali Jamshidi in Russia to share. Um, you know, this, this type of activity is typical of um, political discussion. Um, you know, we're going to go where they aren't in order to get our stuff out. Uh, and that's often off the central internet. Um, and that's a real challenge for us as we try to collect this content. The content becomes harder to track, and it becomes very hard to collect. Um, and uh, we typically in libraries don't use these tools to make our collections available. Um, and we need to be pretty open to, to doing new kinds of things. Um, you know, just as a, a side note, I, at one point in time in my career, I'd been working in, in college IT, and we had moved um, uh, to uh, Google Apps for education. Um, and we did it over the summer. And almost two days after we had initiated it for our, our students, I got a phone call <clears throat> from a group of students in China uh, saying, I can't get to my email. Um, and we quickly figured out that they were being firewalled by the government. Uh, well, Google was at that point in time. Um, and I found myself in an interesting situation where I could tell my students how to break the law in China, or I could um, uh, try to help them do something myself. And it, it, uh, we ended up um, uh, providing uh, a different kind of uh, access for them. Um, but, you know, these are the kind of things that, that can happen uh, when you, when you uh, get outside your comfort zone. Um, this is a picture of Ali. He did a, a, a lot of vlogging and blogging and all kinds of stuff in the 2000s to, to make sure that the voices um, in the Green Movement were heard. Uh, he became a, a fairly well-known activist uh, around the globe. Um, he, after he worked for us at UCLA for a while, he went to work at uh, an organization called Internews, which is an international NGO teaching activists how to communicate safely, how to communicate uh, and keep their anonymity and their privacy. Um, and I wanted to say that um, uh, what Ali does for us is, is he puts a very well-known, trusted face on our collecting. Um, I can go out to, um, uh, I can go out through Ali to a number of places who have collected or are collecting dissenting opinions and dissenting documentation and, and offer um, preservation and hosting services for them. Um, and what we have with Ali is a partner who they f are familiar with, who they trust. Um, he gives us instant credibility with uh, activists and instant access to a lot of their collections. So uh, we're talking about uh, some very sensitive stuff, um, you know, and uh, this, We've got stuff that um, uh, people and organizations don't want you to see. Um, and hackers happen, right? <clears throat> it happens to a lot of us every day. Um, and you know, you, you might think it's odd that we would collect these things to make ourselves a bigger target. Um, you know, uh, I don't have any, uh, any super answers for you in terms of information security, because we don't do anything special. We don't do anything in turn. We just try to focus on best practices um, we try to find a balance between uh, policy, privacy, and security. Um, I do want to say uh, that the best um, approach to information security that I've found uh, for some of these collections, depending on their volatility, volatility is just to simply not accession them, um, to collect them. Uh, we believe in terms of some of this content that preservation is more important than access. Uh, and that um, it's better that these collections exist than don't. Um, one of the other things to remember is really uh, you have to have some flexibility. Um, I often, you know, I've heard a few times uh, from some of my folks, oh, you can't do that. Um, you know, you can't open that firewall port. Um, but you have to be able to do that. You have to be able to get, a, uh, get some flexibility, do some things you're not really comfortable doing, in order to collect this content. And we feel like um, it's very, very important. Um, very important. So 
Uh, just a few more case studies from me. Um, uh, back, to be, back to the Inter uh, International Digi Digital Ephemera Project. Uh, one of the things we thought would be really interesting and great is if we could um, uh, get some digitization equipment um, in the path of Syrian refugees, um, just to see sort of what they had. Um, we found a partner in uh, uh, American University in Iraqi Suleimani, which is in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, it's one of these over here. Uh, they had um, about they, they had a good number of uh, Syrian refugees going through there. Uh, we partnered with um, a faculty member there who was interested in digitizing content with her students, basically as a teaching and learning tool. And we were interested to see just basically what they would dig up. Um, what we found um, was not quite what we expected. What you're seeing here is um, a book from Abu Ghraib prison, uh, which is a prison in, inside uh, Iraq. It was a political prison under Saddam Hussein, a political prison under the United States regime. Um, uh, and um, it's not quite what we expected, but it's what we got. It's, it's, this story uh, comes from one of the students at American University, Iraq Suleimani. Um, it's a, it's a, a religious text. Uh, it's mislabeled uh, for some obfuscation. Um, it's a banned book in, in Iraq. One of the other things we found um, was a couple of notes hidden within them. Um, one of these notes uh, basically says, you need to take this out into the sun in order to read the hidden text. Um, kind of a funny thing to write. Um, sunlight's not hard to find in the Middle East, I would imagine. Um, but it also says, uh, in, that, in that hidden text, it says, um, I hid the books and guns with my family. Um, and uh, I kept, I put it there so that our family would be safe. And I just, you know, I think it's interesting uh, that these um, uh, certain repressive regimes around the globe find both books and guns equally as dangerous. Uh, the other note uh, is a note from a father to a son um, promising him a bicycle if he does well in his exams. Um, his father was in prison for about um, uh, 10 years. Uh, it took this note about two years to get out. Uh, and by the time it did get out, he had learned how to read. He had passed his exams. Um, so uh, one, uh, you know, one thing I'd say that, you know, I, I've said this a, a few times, but not directly, is really when you get outside of doing the, um, when you get outside and you start doing this kind of collecting, um, uh, you, face, you face difficulties, you, you face technical difficulties, you, fi you face um, difficulties in terms of, uh, uh, it, it's really hard to build trust relationships. It takes a lot of time. Um, but you get a lot of uh, wonderful things that happen to you. You know, we do, we, we, we have a lot of uh, serendipity in the collecting we do. Uh, we didn't expect this uh, uh, book and note from Abu Ghraib, but we got it, and we think it's wonderful. Um, and we think it's stories like this that make the kind of activities we're doing um, uh, important. Lisa? Hi, everyone. Um, it's a real honor to be here in front of you today, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, my name is Lisa McCauley. I'm at the UCLA uh, Library, where I work in the Digital Library Program. Um, and I'd like to just take a moment. Um, you've heard a bunch of different case studies from Todd, and you'll hear a few more from me and, and later from Heather. Uh, and you saw the opening video where we talked about things that uh, we have. Um, which 
some of those things we haven't talked about before in public um, and uh, are not readily available. And I, I'm pretty sure, uh, in fact, we, we kind of reached out to colleagues across the country when we were preparing this talk and we heard about collections that you all have as well that are exactly like this. And one esteemed colleague said, oh yeah, we take a lot of stuff in and we just don't tell anyone we have it. Um, so I'd like you, and you know, I guess, there, there are some good reasons for that, which Todd uh, pointed out. Um, so I'd like you to take just a couple minutes, turn to somebody next to you, somebody you know, somebody you don't know, and um, see if uh, either one of you have any collections like that or something that comes to mind, um, or, or something that uh, has brought controversy either in your university or, or beyond. So I'll just give you about two minutes uh, to talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll ask you to finish up, if you can, to say your last few words. Um, all right, thank you. I'm, I'm kind of excited to have heard so much chatter. I was a little afraid it might be quiet at the end of the afternoon here, um, so I'm glad you found stuff to talk about. Now, you can probably guess what I'm going to ask you to do next. Um, how about a couple of volunteers to either rat on your neighbor or talk about something uh, that, that you feel that you can talk about in front of the cameras. Uh, as Cliff said, we're going to turn off the cameras later so that you can talk more frankly and so that we can talk more frankly. Um, any volunteers? Thank you. I think Todd knows some of this. Um, we've been on panels together. Um, I, ha uh, I run an education program, so we don't have a collection, but our graduates work in collections, including collections of human rights organizations, uh, both uh, Witness and um, uh, uh, Human Rights Watch both of which put cameras in the hands of people in incredibly uh, horrific situations, uh, women getting stoned, stoned like with stones. Um, uh, uh, and, and so these, these things, though the goal is to inform the rest of the world about what has happened, uh, uh, just sending, putting unredacted um, uh, 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 pieces of these videos out there will result in murder of the people who took the videos. So, um, so it's a matter of redacting things. And recently, actually, uh, about three weeks ago, Human Rights Watch got hacked um, uh, and they thought they had very high security and the hackers took some of their, uh, the original material unredacted and they're incredibly worried about what could happen with that. So, so get, getting hacked is another issue even for uh, when you have this material, uh, you know, not offline but not cataloged or, or, or whatever, so. Excellent example, thank you so much. Uh, anyone else? Example, controversial collection, dangerous collection. Okay, we'll come back to that topic later. Um, I wanna uh, just turn to a couple of case examples. Um, this is part of the collection that you saw uh, earlier in the video. Uh, it's uh, for, from a group of librarians who work together to um, take digital versions of highly sensitive documents from inside China. Uh, documents that in this case uh, were absolutely confidential, as marked here, and um, distributed only very um, narrowly. And as you can see, this is from 1950, so maybe it's not so risky anymore to, to sneak this material out, but I want to remind you that just earlier this year in January, um, publishers in Hong Kong were found missing and uh, protesters in Hong Kong took to the streets. Uh, and in particular, they were concerned about the lack the um, encroaching Chinese government on the freedom that Hong Kong has enjoyed uh, up until now. 
And, and so these are still quite dangerous propositions for people. And here are librarians and archivists inside China, just like us, um, who think that it's more important to get this information out than to be completely safe. And so this is one of the collections that we don't have um, available at this moment, but that uh, we hope to make available soon. Um, and again, as, as Todd had pointed out, it's one nation's state secrets, and for us it's, uh, it's information about how that state maintained um, control, how it ran uh, its, its government in ways that uh, we're interested in finding out more about and, and bringing to the light uh, a lot of devastation and, and oppression that happened during that era and continues to happen. Um, I also like to turn a little bit to uh, how to make relationships work, and this has been really key to everything that we've worked on um, in the projects that Todd presented, and um, I want to highlight a few that we've worked on, and the number one thing that Todd pointed out was that this, this kind of work doesn't, doesn't happen easily and it doesn't happen quickly, and um, in this uh, slide, I. I show several of our partners for a project that we're working on in the Sinai Desert in Egypt, and we talked about working together for at least five years before any pixels or digitization or any sort of um, work or collaboration happened. And at any point during that time, there's a lot of time invested in planning and thinking through and talking through activities. And this is where I sort of highlight one of the risks in this kind of collecting is that you know, at any point it could have fallen through, it might not have worked, and it was a huge risk on both the partners that we're working with and both our, uh, from our point of view, that we would invest a lot of time in a relationship or a project that might not come to fruition. But we had faith and, and some trust, and uh, we decided to go for it and to see what we could learn. At the, at the worst, we could learn something, um, and we might not have this project come to fruition, but we could, we could learn from each other. Um, and so, uh, one of the things that underlies a lot of this type of collecting, if, and especially you'll notice like the Chinese documents uh, and the Green Movement uh, videos, these are materials that are digital and they don't need to reside with just one owner. And that's really enabled us to move into um, fairly easily into post-custodial archive building, which many of you are probably familiar with. And, uh, it's really suiting when you're working with international partners or any sort of cultural um, group that is different from your own, especially coming from the United States uh, as, as a imperial and colonial power, uh, that we do not go in, take the goods, and run out. Um, so these materials speak for the people in their area, they have a context, they have a place of origin, and we want to work together and we want to bring resources to these collections without um, taking the collections away and without taking them out of context where they have meaning and where the people who own them can make sense of them in a way that um, outsiders cannot. And so, uh, through doing that, we really have to promote authenticity, and, and that's one of the things we've been able to do working with Ali Jamshidi, and um, he's uh, hired and recruited uh, graduate students from Iran who work with him uh, and who have done really elaborate uh, metadata for us. And I have, I'm so impressed with the detail and level of work these students do uh, who are not library students, who are not uh, in the information profession. They're, they're pursuing degrees in um, advanced degrees in language studies, uh, completely dedicated to this project. And in August, um, when I was trying to fix a timesheet for one of them, I checked in with Ali and said, oh, I gotta send this over. No, you can't send that to him. He's in Iran right now, and that would put him in danger. So these, these are people who are really putting um, a lot of effort into these collections, and, and that's where the authenticity comes from, that we're not coming in, taking collections. We're actually letting the people who this content means something um, describe it. And then we work with them, of course, to talk about the things that we do understand, which are metadata standards, description, fields, um, managing files, file names, repositories, moving files around, and all in an effort to um, 
preserve these files, especially the cell phone videos from Ali, a, a lot of these were decaying rapidly because these are proprietary formats, all sorts of formats all across the gamut um, that we wanted to convert to something more stable. Um, and so we pursue um, uh, a policy of joint publication without acquisition. So through memorandums of understanding, and there's term limits in them, so it's not like anybody's locked into anything, but that creates this sense of trust and faith where, where we can work together and gain from, from the collaboration. Uh, and so from the Sinai project, uh, this is one of the examples. We used multispectral imaging with, with a very um, sophisticated digitization setup uh, that traveled to Sinai where there is no internet in the um, organization where they're working. And uh, power is not always guaranteed, but most of the time it's there. And uh, this is an example of, of a hidden text, a medical text underneath a um, later manuscript. Um, and this is what it looks like in that area. So um, it's just a, a very different atmosphere to work in than what uh, we're used to working in. And it really, though, made sense to take the material, take the digitization equipment and the collaboration to the, the site of origin rather than the other way around. And one of the things that's super critical for this area is um, while these materials are medieval manuscripts that we're working on, and, and a lot of times we can say, well, they've been around for a thousand years, they're on parchment, they're, they're going to hang in there, they're going to be just fine. But they're in a region that is highly unstable, and as we know from things that have happened in Tunisia and other places throughout northern Africa, these, these materials may have been stable for a long time, but that doesn't mean they'll be respected by all people around them, and this is a, currently a highly um, fundamentalist area. Uh, so. It's, it's more at risk than it used to be. Um, and lastly, I'll talk about just a, a, another collaboration that Todd mentioned, which is uh, with the National Library of Cuba. And again, uh, the, this organization is very sophisticated. They don't, they don't need, uh, they've been doing their own digitization for a long time, but they're looking to amplify uh, their efforts and uh, also to, to have a publication partner, somebody who can put things on the web in a way that they're not able to. So recently, and just last week, we sent down um, some digitization equipment to um, digitization professionals, and they did training in English and Spanish um, and left behind um, documentation in Spanish and English. And so that's, uh, and this is some of the material they're going to, uh, they're going to digitize. And the choice of what they're digitizing is, is really up to them, knowing their collections and what they've been working on and what things uh, are in a state like this that need uh, digitization as an opportunity to, to preserve the material. Um, and so I'm going to, uh, at this point, turn it over to Heather, who's going to talk a little bit more of, about the scandalous collections that we have in our possession, including blank forms and uh, other things that, that could get you in a lot of trouble. Thank you, Lisa. Yes. Hello, I'm Heather Briston. I am the University Archivist at UCLA. And for this afternoon, I bring the scandal. <laughs> All right. Hopefully you can see out there, this is a uh, lovely picture of the headquarters of Scientology. In 1973, UCLA was donated a Scientology collection. We described it in our online catalog. We have a finding aid up on the Online Archive of California. It has nine boxes, includes 4.5 linear feet of material. We've had it open for research ever since it's been processed. But with greater visibility of, with our collections and online access comes a few more questions. So in 2000, UCLA was threatened with legal action by the Church of Scientology International. Now, hopefully many of you are familiar with uh, the fact that this Church of Scientology is very litigious. And they uh, put forward such claims that um, the materials were stolen, the materials were confidential, it was covered under a priest penitent privilege, and that we should cease and desist and return all materials. These are the kind of materials that we have here. This happens to be, for those of you who hopefully can see, this is the Sea Org contract. 
Now, if you saw a recent documentary or have read any of the recent tell-all books about Scientology, the fact that you must be willing to sign a contract to stay with it for over a billion years should not be a surprise, but yet this was one of our confidential documents. That then is uh, surpassed, though, however, by our auditor's worksheet that is a privileged document and must be returned. This is the actual document. It's blank. <laughs> then we have Jenna Elfman. One of the things that uh, Sharon, if Sharon was here, would be telling you about was the, both about the external and the internal presser, pressure that she was receiving at that time about these collections. So people from within UCLA were sending her emails, asking her such questions like, have you briefed the university librarian about this, including the issues because at UCLA, if you, ha you are responsible for all liabilities, fines, penalties, and actual damages that rise from litigation. And does she agree with your views? And, at, and she also received other messages that said, I imagine I will shortly be get, uh, getting a moderately threatening letter coupled with a request to meet with the chancellor. So noting that these types of co collections, not only do we receive pressure from the outside, but we can receive pressure from our own institutions. She even received a call from Jenna Elfman, <laughs> pleading to exchange the collection for the red and green volumes that had newly been published by the Church of Scientology International. Now, what I can tell you is that we still have this collection. It is still available for research, and people do still use it for research. The modern archive was born in revolution, the French Revolution to be exact. Rather than taking their anger out on the records, they recognized that archives could serve as a record of, op of oppression, greed, and corruption. Thus, the notion of the accountability value of archives was born and continues to this day. In the particular case that we see here, there were documents collected by three researchers between 2006 and 2011. At a point in about 2013, there began to be a real risk of preservation of the material and they started to be reformatted. At about this same time, these researchers became, uh, began a discussion with the British Library about finding a permanent home for this collection. In a statement, in a recent statement refusing the collection, the British Library stated that they could not take the collection because the materials are subject to copyright law and therefore there is a difficulty providing access and that the library judged that some material could contravene the Terrorism Act of 2006, which specifies that specific responsibilities to anyone in the UK that provides access to terrorist publications and the legal advice that they received highlighted any risk of making the materials accessible. So now I have another question for all of you. How many of you agree with the British Library statement? Show of hands. Nobody's going there, okay. <laughs> How many of you would, ar uh, would this archive have presented any issues? How about that question? Boy, this is a bold group. <laughs> oh yeah, I was gonna say, I think there's there's issues, there's issues, but it's, it's the discussion of those issues that we're here about today. Now Cliff spoke about this issue uh, in his opening uh, talk, and I'm very glad that he started this conversation because I think this is one of the, in some cases, very troubling areas for us as archivists and librarians to discuss the right to be forgotten. 
it is a complex issue for us because we support the idea of protection from fraud. As we've seen in a lot of these contentious collections, people give them to us at risk of their lives. We are concerned about issues that arise from online bullying and false accusations and material such as this. But what about things that should not be forgotten? Not everyone should be forgotten, especially when the result is literally changing the historical record. As you know, in Europe, they do have a right to be forgotten. And uh, as of May 2014, Google has removed over 1.3 million URLs from its search engine. Most were removed, and this should not be a surprise, from Facebook, YouTube, Google Groups, and Twitter. However, they do note that ultimate decision is made by a human uh, regarding removal because the variables, including public interest claims, need to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. For example, there happened to be a British doctor who requested that over 50 links about botched medical procedures be removed. In the end, Google removed three results that contained personal information about the doctor. And of course, this only covers, uh, covers Google in Europe, and so materials can often be found elsewhere. This is an excerpt from our deed of gift that we actually have about the Green Movement. And it is, it is really how we go about managing and being mindful of third parties in our archives. We take this, and all of you who collect materials as we do, take this very seriously. And this is the process for every negoti donor negotiation that we have for unique materials, because there are always concerns about, con uh, about certain content in our collections. It's also part of building trust, of building that community or that um, relationship with our donors. And it also is a way for us to discuss with our donors both the risks and rewards of access to their collections. Accountability. It is one of the primary functions of both libraries and archives. It is part of our mission. It is a core value of archivists and forms the basis of our, of our ethics. Social responsibility is another core value. What we collect and preserve, what is, cr what is created that we are not collecting, making those choices, making those decisions, and taking those actions. And then the decision about how and when we provide access. In 1934, FDR, when establishing the National Archives of the United States, said, a nation must believe in three things. It must believe in the past. It must believe in the future. It must, above all, believe in the capacity of its own people so to learn from the past that they can gain in judgment in creating their own future. And what I'm going to talk about next is a perfect example of that from Guatemala. In 2005 in Guatemala, there was an explosion near a police compound that started a search for bombs left after the war. Found abandoned in a munitions depot, they found it stuffed with records from the Guatemalan secret police. As, a, as a one person who saw it said, it was filled to the brim, head high, with heaps of papers. So now, 
As a project of the University of Texas, the Lozano Long Institute for Latin American Studies, the Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice, and the Benson Latin American Collection, with the Archivo Historico de la Policia Nacional de Guatemala, we have a digitization project. And part of that is this discussion and the recognition that the right to be remembered is more important than the right to be forgotten. It is about preservation over access, and it is concerning cultural sensitivity. For those of you who might be in, uh, familiar with either the Guatemala case or other cases throughout the world relating to the records of secret police forces, that trust is critical to building and sustaining these challenged, uh, both challenged collections and their content. It is both legal and societal issues involved in confidentiality of both the oppressors and the oppressed, the informants, the, uh, the issues involved, as well as topics of truth and reconciliation within those countries. And so in 2009, the archive, established legal certainty over the ownership of the material in cooperation with the, minister, the Ministry of the Interior and the Ministry of Culture and Sport. By the end of 2013, there were 15 million documents scanned, about 20% of the total. And in 2015, they had celebrated the first anniversary of, dis of the discovery of those heaps high uh, stacks of papers. Another area of cultural sensitivity that I'd like to talk about this afternoon is a, an aspect of trust and building, uh, of trust building. Historically, archivists have not had always a good reputation in this area, extending and reinforcing at times the cultural hegemony and appropriation. In these cases, I'm talking about often our treatment of and collection of materials of indigenous populations. However, with the work in the United States, Canada, and Australia on such best practices as the Native American protocols, the discussioning, the listening, the trust building, and the action has begun. This happens to be an example out of the University of California at Berkeley, where Professor Kim Christian Whitney is doing a collaboration with the Center for Digital Archaeology at UC Berkeley on an IMLS grant to build tools. And the site, I encourage you all to look at it. It's referred to as Mercutu, M-K-U-R-T-U. That's the set of tools. And they are for indigenous communities themselves as they manage and share their digital cultural heritage. So as you can see here, it's, it's very much akin to uh, Creative Commons licenses, but instead these are traditional knowledge licenses. And what it is, is a way for communities themselves to tag those materials whose access depend heavily on the local context from which it derives. Certain materials that can only be seen by either members of the group or members of the group that have reached a certain stature, for example. So now, I've got another question for the audience. You're on. Do you have, in your repositories, collections from indigenous communities? Show of hands. I was gonna say, we should have good show of hands here. Have you worked with the community on access and or description issues? Show of hands. Marvelous, marvelous. Now we have some new tool, tools to use as well. And so now I would like to turn it back to Todd to finish us up. All right, thank, thanks, Heather. Um, <clears throat> it just, uh, you know, um, I just wanted to say in closing here that, uh, 
you know, some of the things we're doing, uh, some of the collections we're offered, um, uh, you know, they're, we feel like we've, we've got a pretty good background at UCLA uh, with doing this type of collecting, putting together certain documentation that makes it um, uh, possible, uh, the legal framework, um, and, you know, we've, um, uh, we do have some um, experience working with some of these um, activists and their uh, hacker colleagues, uh, and we just wanted to say if, if there is interest in the community, uh, in finding um, uh, a group of uh, uh, libraries interested in, in doing this kind of collecting, please um, please reach out to us. Uh, reach out to me. I'm sure you can find me. I'm on email and Twitter, and we'll see. Let's start talking. Uh, Howard mentioned earlier that we've we've already uh, served on a panel together, and we've we would love to um, uh, uh, um, expand that conversation to others who are interested in doing the same thing. Uh, I wanted to close with a quote here from our university librarian who, who couldn't be here today. Um, uh, and she's, you know, her position on this is really, you know, that we should not be uh, bystanders. Uh, we should be actively out there collecting this content. Um, there's more and more of it that shows up on the web every day. There's more and more of it that emerges. Um, uh, it's, uh, as I mentioned before, it's hard to find, it's hard to collect. Um, but it is out there and it is possible. It takes time to make those relationships with those online communities, with the activists. Um, uh, it just, uh, it just is, we really feel like it's worth it. Um, we feel like that is the kind of collections we're doing, the kind of collecting we're doing. Um, uh, we hope uh, uh, are, are bold and you see them as, as things you'd like to do as well. We'd love to bring um, partners in. I want to thank you uh, for your attention. Uh, as Cliff mentioned, we're going to go into some Q&A now. Um, uh, but uh, just before we get there, I'd, I'd, I'd love to say a few more words. Um, you know, uh, we talked a little bit about the Scientology collection, but Heather didn't really mention the razor blades and the smoke alarms and all the other things that happened while we made that collection available. Um, uh, those things sort of happen. Um, I want to do another show of hands. How many people uh, were asked by their um, institution to call the State Department last year? Just me? Um, that happened to me um, about uh, six times. Um, I only called them, I actually didn't call them any of those times. Um, but when you're uh, sitting in Los Angeles and um, uh, the interview is just um, about to be released, and you go to your chancellor and you say, oh, I found this really great North Korean content. Um, they, they pause and they go, oh, have you called the State Department? <laughs> right? Um, on one hand, it makes it really fun to do these kind of projects. Uh, on the other hand, you know, it does, um, it does make you pause. Um, you know, uh, how, many, uh, how many people actually send um, uh, uh, camera operators out into the field. Anybody have partners they do digitization with? A couple? Um, all right, uh, how many um, send their digitization partners into the uh, Egyptian desert with $9,000 in their money belt? <laughs> Just me? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, we began this international digital ephemera project with a partner. Um, that partner, we were told, you know, we're really interested in you guys doing um, uh, Middle Eastern collecting. Here's your first partner, the National Library of Israel. Um, let me tell you, when you go out and you start talking to people in the Middle East about their collections, and it's the United States and Israel knocking on the door, you, you don't get a lot of answers early on. It, it, and so one of the, it, it took us some time to find the right kind of angle in there and the right kind of people. Um, uh, the last thing is, um, you know, one of the other challenges is really incredibly bureaucratic. You often get these things when you work at large institutions and public institutions. Um, you know, I was really, it's really easy to send a digitization equipment to um, Iraq. It's almost impossible to send it to Cuba. Right? I had people there last week, the president was there two weeks ago, um, and it was just kind of funny how, we, how much trouble we had uh, sending equipment into there. 
um, uh, I, you know, again, it's worth it. Uh, the uh, sticking with it, uh, the, uh, the patience, the trust building, um, they're wonderful. Uh, the outcomes are incredible. Um, and Cliff mentioned earlier uh, about um, uh, you know being you know brave collectors, and you know um, when you're working with a partner who uh, couldn't go home for his mother's funeral, um, who's been exiled from his country for 30 years. Um, it doesn't, you know, it, it, he's really the brave one. Um, all we're doing is really trying to make sure that uh, his sacrifice uh, is remembered. And that's, that's all I wanted to say. And I hope there are some, I hope there are some questions.